everybody. Uh, welcome back to another astronomy lecture. Um, today what I want to do is take you on a tour of the telescopes that we use um, to capture light outside of what our eyes can see. That's what I mean when I'm saying non-optical telescopes right now. So like, you know, radio waves and gamma rays and all the parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that are outside of the rainbow of colors that we see. Um, and uh, there are a few other non-optical telescopes, like for instance, the, there are detectors out there for cosmic rays, which is not electromagnetic radiation, right? So cosmic rays are actual particles being flung across space at close to light speed often, but not, of course, can't actually, actually obtain light speed. And uh, the latest one, which um, I have a separate presentation on, uh, gravitational waves, right, which is the kind of latest tool in the um, astrophysics community's tool belt. But for now, let me uh, talk you through what we have been doing the last half of the 20th century, I guess, as soon as people realized um, that they could make these devices and that they would provide a lot more information. I'm going to just sort of step you through from uh, the lowest frequency um, to the highest frequency, you know, and skipping over, of course, the stuff we've already done about optical telescopes. And there's a lot of similarities, you know. As you'll see here with the radio telescopes and all the way up until we get to x-rays, they basically are reflecting dishes, you know, to concentrate and collect a lot of um, light, even if it's not light that we can see. Radio waves, of course, is a type of light, just very low frequency. And um, of these telescopes, the um, radio waves are the most often found on the ground. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the atmosphere is very uh, translucent, obviously, to visible light, which is <laughs> why we evolved to see it. And then they also are um, uh, translucent to radio waves, which, of course, is why we use them so often to communicate with. So on the ground, you'll frequently find those two types of telescopes, optical and radio telescopes. So um, what you see here, frequently if you're driving around and you see like a dome like this up in the upper left-hand corner like this, uh, they, they frequently, these are domes that allow radio waves to penetrate through. And um, obviously you don't, you know, they can be opaque to visible light because that's not what the radio telescope is doing. And... Um, so if you're just driving around and you see like a, a, a spherical dome like this, it is, is probably encapsulating a radio telescope that may be for astronomy, it may be the military, it may be for the FAA, it may be for telecommunications, although they don't usually, um, you know, for, for radio telescopes for telecommunications, they usually don't cover it like this, right? So they usually cover it like this for either because... Um, they're making very fine-tuned measurements, and so they want to protect the radio dish itself, um, or they, um, you know, it's some something to do with secrecy, and they don't want people to be able to track which way the radio telescope is pointed. Right. The other thing you'll see often in radio telescopes, and this appears a lot in movies, is though they will make an array out of them, like this, and so you'll see these dramatic shots of many, many radio telescopes, each one of which is not uh, really super big, but the array is all connected. And, um, you know, so you effectively have a huge diameter telescope. So these are two pretty famous ones. This one on the upper left is here in Massachusetts, out in Westford, Mass, run by the MIT lab. And down here, uh, this one is in New Mexico. It's the BLA for the very large array. <laughs> very original. And so what they're doing with these very large arrays, right, is they're pointing them, usually what they do is they point them towards the same source, but because the telescopes are separated in space a little bit, the waves hit each telescope at a slightly different phase. And then you can, that's what interferometry is, is looking at the difference in phase between uh, the two telescopes. See how this one on the top is hitting uh, just before the peak, and over here on this one it's hitting just before the trough. And so that's the difference in phase for waves, is you know where you are when you ride along with the wave. And so when the signals get to the computer, they can, you know, determine how in phase or out of phase they are, and they can determine um, more precisely the direction that the radio waves are going, and that, of course, gives you better resolution on your image, right? So radio waves having long wavelengths, you tend not to get, be able to get high resolution pictures like you can with a shorter wavelength. Um, but this, uh, this trick, well, you know, using interferometry gives you higher resolutions um, for making your image. 
So you use radio telescopes, generally you're looking at lower energy uh, events or you're looking at um, you know, some, some clouds or some things are opaque to visible light or other frequencies, but it will allow radio waves to come through. So for instance, uh, planet formations are usually happening in the middle of so like dust clouds. And so you can't actually with the optical telescope see in there, but radio waves might make it through. Um, and of course, we know from our study of um, quasars and all that kind of stuff, uh, radio galaxies that uh, accretion disk around black holes can drive a lot of radio signals and stuff like that. Um, and we're always monitoring the sun, of course, with all these different bands of frequencies as we monitor the um, solar activity, both for you know research purposes and, of course, just to monitor the solar weather so that we can make predictions about um, things that might happen to us here on Earth based on solar flares or coronal mass ejections. So moving up the spectrum now, the next one up would be microwave telescopes. And of course, we've looked at a lot of microwave data, right? The, the classic thing, and this is the number one use that people have for microwave telescopes, is to look at um, images of the universe from the very beginning, or as close to the beginning as light was released, of course. We're looking at light that was released uh, as visible light when we look at the cosmic microwave background, but it has been cosmologically shifted all the way into almost the radio frequency range, right, in the micro microwave frequency. This is the same frequency that microwave ovens use to heat your food also, by the way. So that's not a, a coincidence that the names are the same. These are two satellites that are in orbit. So you can certainly detect microwaves uh, from the ground, but if you want to, uh, there's a lot of distortion as it goes through the air. And of course, there are other um, sources of microwave radiation, um, you know, mostly in the tele telecom industry and stuff like that. And so by putting these um, detectors in orbit, they can get high resolution pictures. And of course, they can take data uh, more interrupted and there's, uh, they get cleaner images. Um, it's not confined to just making better and better maps of the cosmic microwave background. You can also, you know, I mean, this, this does correspond to certain energy uh, region and so when you have like accelerated charges of a certain energy then um, they will emit microwaves too and you can use that to study those phenomena. Infrared telescopes um, are sometimes put on Earth. There's a, uh, there's a, a pair of famous ones down here in, in the lower left in Hawaii. Uh, the problem of course is that the Earth and the telescope and everything around it is emitting quite a bit of infrared uh, noise, if you will, and so the telescope needs to be super cooled. And then the atmosphere, of course, itself <laughs> is has a temperature and blurs, in addition also blurs pretty heavily the images going, coming, the signals coming through the atmosphere from space. There's a lot of corrective optics they can do on that, but, uh, um, you know, from the, from the get-go, people were very excited to put these in um, orbit, and the Hubble itself has a component of it that sees in the high-frequency infrared, right? And don't forget, every band outside of the optical, the Roy G. Biv that we use with our eyes, all of these bands are quite large. And so when you talk about the infrared region of the, you know, just the infrared radiation encompasses a larger frequency range than all the colors that we can see with our eye combined. And so you can make infrared telescopes that look in various portions of that frequency band. Um, so on the right, you have a, a satellite, the IRIS, infrared <laughs> astronomical telescope. Um, and of course, there are lots of advantages to being in space, primary of them getting out of the atmosphere, but also for infrared, of course, it's colder out there, and so you, you don't have to worry as much about cooling the telescope, although they do have to cool them. So uh, star cluster formations, um, you know, is one of the things that uh, people will look at with infrared. Infrared also being longer wavelength um, will slip through dust clouds a little bit better, so it's, it's one of the frequency ranges that you can look to peer into something that is opaque otherwise. Um, colder and dustier regions, right? So temperature, of course, the coldest things emit in radio and the hottest things emit in gamma. And so, you know, depending on what you're looking at, you, there may be things that are only visible in infrared astronomy. For, so, so for instance, planets are emitting infrared light directly and nothing higher frequency. And so you can actually image planets directly with infrared. One of the problems with that, of course, is that plants tend to be cl close to stars, and stars also emit in infrared. So, um, and you can see, uh, so here's like the, a cutaway of uh, an infrared telescope, where there's the opening here that allows the light to come in, and then you do have um, 
you know, you got to get your power. Usually they get them from solar panels. And um, they do have uh, coolant on there to keep the equipment cool. And then you can see a little bit of a dish here to bring it into focus, and there's your detector up there, right? So all of these are basically prime mirrors, right? Because you don't need a, a human eye on them, and you don't need the, a camera or anything like that. You just have to actually detect the radio waves or detect the microwaves or detect the infrared. And so they just have their, their primary reflector. And then um, at the focus, the actual antenna that detects the signal. All right, so skipping over the Roy G. Biv colors of the spectrum, you go to ultraviolet telescopes. Um, you know, as you know, because you don't get a sunburn every time you walk outside, uh, you, the atmosphere screens out UV pretty heavily. And so um, as far as I know, there are no ground-based um, ultraviolet telescopes. And they realized pretty early on, if you want to look in this frequency band, where a lot of interesting science can be determined, you're going to have to go uh, into orbit, right? And so the Hopkins is one of the earlier ones, and then later they launched the UIT, and, you know, there's just a, a fleet of telescopes that are, have a sort of program life cycle, and then they replace them. Um, so UV is really good at looking at, um, you know, the birth of stars when the, after, after the stars start their fusion, and yeah, since it's a shorter wavelength, you can get pretty high resolution. And of course, um, you know, things that are higher energy than regular visible light. So when you talk about like a blue star, you know, being hotter, of course, if you're even hotter than a blue star or a star that appears blue to us may actually be peeking out in the ultraviolet, right? And we just don't, don't see that as a color, but we can detect it with these telescopes. And so here's a cutaway of an of a ultraviolet telescope, right, pointed out uh, to the upper left here. And you can see down here, once again, there's a primary mirror which gets refocused down here onto uh, a detector. Okay. Even higher frequency, we go to X-ray telescopes. Now, at this point, the wavelengths become so short, and as you know probably with your own experience with X-rays, right, they, they, they penetrate through a lot of matter, right? And uh, so X-rays tend to uh, be so short wavelength that you don't you really use dishes uh, to focus them anymore. Instead, you've got to use a slightly different technology, which I'll, I'll show you in a second. And um, that continues, of course, when we go higher in the, in the, in the spectrum here. And um, this, of course, is when you want to look for really energetic events, right? Like uh, um, hot gases around neutron stars or, the, you know, accretion disks from black holes can accelerate things up to um, the temperatures and speeds that you would need to uh, emit X-rays. And the most famous one of these, of course, is the Chandra X-ray Observatory. X-rays also don't do really well coming through the uh, Earth's atmosphere. And so um, these are almost, as far as I know, maybe like UV always in, um, in orbit. And the way you're going to focus um, an X-ray, right, like I said, you can't just capture it with the dish because the dish will either just absorb the X-ray or the X-ray would pass through it is they kind of do like um, a reflection technique, but it's not direct re reflection, right? So as the x-rays come in from the left, what you have is you have these nested cylinders that taper and become narrower and narrower di diameter, and they bring the light to a focus eventually on the far right-hand side. And the way they're doing this is as the x-ray come in, you can think of it more like a tennis ball that then bounces off the side of the wall, comes in at really high angles and kind of grazes along the side and then gets bounced towards the middle, right? As opposed to with the longer wavelength electromagnetic radiation, you just have it like reflect directly off of a dish. But here you really need sort of the glancing angle. That's a detail of that is up here in the upper left, right? So you want this angle here to be coming in almost sideways. And so then it gl kind of glances off and then you can collect the x-rays in this way. And, um, and right. I guess that's all I have to say about that. Uh, gamma ray telescopes. Okay, so gamma rays, right, is the whole swath of things that are even shorter wavelength and higher energy than X-rays, and you really just can't collimate or focus those at all. Uh, they are just so high energy and so um, short wavelength. Um, you're almost doing, you know, you're pretty much doing a photon by photon. Uh, detection at this point, and so you're not really thinking about a continuous wave and trying to focus that wave. Um, and you know, how would you do that anyway? Because the wavelength is shorter than than an individual atom at this point. And so, what you do is you have a uh, technique that can also be used uh, for cosmic rays, and that is you have a scintillating material. 
And the idea of the scintillation material, which was invented by high energy physicists to use in labs to detect um, high energy particles, is that when um, uh, the gamma ray is passing through the scintillation material, there is a chance, right, that that gamma ray will be absorbed by uh, the nucleus of an atom in this material. And what you do is you fill it with so-called scintillating material, <laughs> which of which there's different kinds. And um, what that means is when that energy is absorbed, it causes that material to release a visible light photon. And then you have detectors placed all around the scintillating material that's looking for that secondary optical um, signal. And this is a black box, so if you see light within the black box, you're saying, oh, well, how was this generated? It was generated by an incoming gamma ray that gave enough energy that then got converted into a visible light um, photon. And so they use these photomultiplier tubes because a one photon event is pretty hard to detect uh, directly. And photomultiplier tube does exactly what it sounds like. It takes one photon in and then multiplies it basically through a cascade of larger and larger voltages until you can actually generate electrical signal. And then by having a whole array of these and trying to determine the timing and everything like that, you know, you can sort of determine the path of the gamma rays through the cube, and then you can reconstruct on a computer the direction the gamma rays must have taken, right? So there's a lot more computational work here. You're not really making images directly. You're, it's, a, it's a different kind of detector, but, um, you know, ultimately it is detecting the presence of uh, another element of the, of the electromagnetic spectrum, and that is the gamma rays. Right. So cosmic rays, they also will use these scintillating, scintillating materials sometimes in that uh, these high energy protons, which is mostly what a cosmic ray is made out of, can also, um, you know, just like the gamma ray can't be detected directly, but uh, that, that cosmic ray might also hit something inside the scintillating material and then cause it to glow. And then you pick up on that visible light. And so this is um, um, the both things have an additional thing, which is something called Cherenkov radiation, which people use to detect um, these high uh, energy particles. So if you can create a high energy particle, either directly because the cosmic ray is coming in at like 99% the speed of light, so you've got this high energy proton that's moving at 99% the speed of light, or, or you have a gamma ray that then hits uh, some particle like in our atmosphere or in the scintillating material and causes it to go uh, uh, the absorbing proton or whatever in the material um, gains enough energy that it's going pretty close to the speed of light. Something really interesting can happen, and that is the speed of light in a vacuum, of course, is the, is the maximum speed that anything can go. But as you enter a new medium like the atmosphere or liquid, frequently the scintillating materials are embedded in liquids, the speed of light goes lower, right? Because there's, there's more charges in there and the electric field is different and the speed of light just drops. Now, here's the thing is you could be going 99% the speed of light in outer space and not break any of the rules of physics, and then you hit water or you hit the atmosphere, and all of a sudden now you're breaking the local speed limit, right? You're not going faster than the speed of light in outer space. That's impossible. But you can have charged particles temporarily going faster than the speed of light in air or in water. Now, what's going to happen there is uh, they're going to have to break down to the speed limit and to do that, they're going to have to shed energy. And this Russian scientist uh, over 100 years ago, uh, Dr. Cherenkov, uh, made a calculation that the way that they would release that breaking energy would be in the form of blue light. They would emit a cone of blue light. And um, this is uh, called Cherenkov radiation in his honor. And so what you actually do in a lot of these detectors, and some people actually use the, the, the Earth's atmosphere itself as a giant scintillating material, if a cosmic ray or a very high energy gamma ray then is absorbed and then creates a proton that's going faster than the speed of light in the atmosphere, they have to slow down, right? And when they slow down, they release this Cherenkov light, which is just basically blue light. And they, you can build an optical detector then to look for the blue light that indicates the presence of either a cosmic ray that came in or a very high energy gamma ray that came in. And uh, remember, I showed you the video of those uh, mirrors I was constructing at Purdue. That, that's what the astrophysicists were doing with those mirrors, is they were actually looking for blue light that indicated the presence of cosmic rays or very high energy gamma rays. Um, so you, this is visible with, uh, to the human eye if you um, 
go to a nuclear power plant or film inside of a nuclear power plant, right? Those control rods are frequently in water. Water has a very slow speed of light and some of the radioactive material as it enters that water is going faster than the speed of light in water and so it has to break down and you get this blue glow that comes out of the, out of the water and that's Cherenkov radiation. Um, astronauts have reported seeing Cherenkov radiation in their visor for their helmet. So their space helmet, right, the, the, the glass or whatever material there is a solid so the speed of light is very slow in there and um, occasionally an individual cosmic ray or gamma ray will, will be absorbed and they will get a flash of blue light um, that they can actually detect with their own eyes, right? Human eyes actually is very sensitive. If, it's, if you've gotten used to the dark um, and there are no uh, light distractions, you can actually detect uh, single photons. So this is what an array of uh, these optical mirrors that are looking for Cherenkov uh, radiation uh, look like. This is the Whipple telescope out in Arizona. And um, so they're just looking for blue light as an indirect measurement for cosmic rays and gamma rays. So I think the only thing left at this point is um, to talk about gravitational waves, which I'll do in a separate presentation.